I, I'm going to tell you one of the observations that I made since I've been here. There's, there's three things. There's passion sitting in this room. There's love. And there's empathy. And I think if you have those three things, they're very soft. And, but yet they're easily quantified uh, from a business plan. But in, in our case, we, we had to strip it down to the bare bones and then rebuild it to try to capture the original intent of the, of the concept from back 1976. Um, so again, it was a chapter seven, it was a price versus value. Um, lack of reinvestment, and I'll say this over and over again, the reinvestment in the brand is absolutely critical. Today, you know, you heard a little bit yesterday about you know, problems in a restaurant or what, what somebody would tell 10 people. You know, today is completely different. They'll tell 10 million people because there's social media and there's Facebook and there's Yelp. And um, you have to execute flawlessly every single day with every single customer. Um, so our strategy was to rebuild, the, our five-year plan right now is to rebuild it to 200 restaurants and to continue to improve top-line sales, improve unit economics, and continue to grow a brand with integrity. And by doing that, what do, what do I mean by that? Well, um, we are in the franchise Oregon, so we're build, building true franchising. And so today, the distribution is we, we're in 15 states in the U.S., and we're also in 10 countries. And so as I'm speaking here, uh, we're opening uh, our third restaurant in the UAE, uh, we're opening another restaurant in Panama, we're opening two restaurants in Florida, uh, we're opening one in Houston, and so there's a, it's, it's a heady time for us because people are, are, uh, are joining back with the passion and with the love and the empathy that a brand should have. Five pillars, uh, again, I wanted to share these with you because I don't care what you're running, what kind of business you're running, these five pillars are in, in vital. Um, every single company every, in every single area uh, of the world should take a look at, okay, so, um, what do you do with your brand? Uh, what do you do with your business? So the first one is to create and sustain momentum. Um, and I'm gonna go over each one with some bullet points to help you. And the other is develop, develop habitual dependability. You gotta get it right all the time, not some of the time. Uh, maintain continuous connection, and again, that's some of the things that I'll, I'll, I'll speak about here in a little bit. And then what's your big picture outcome? Where do you wanna go, where do you wanna be? Um, what do you wanna contribute to the world? And, um, and what are you doing to give back? And then the last one is uh, to engage, to enchant, and to enthrall. In other words, to build a point of differentiation that's, that's better than anybody else. So create, sustain. So um, this is basically making the decision to go. So once you've done your analysis, once you've done, once you strip down your, your business, you, you say, okay, so how do we get lift off? Uh, what do we do? And for us, it was the franchise model. So taking a look at the investment, taking a look at the model, taking a look at our unit economics, taking a look at our unit level profitability, and building it back from there to say, okay, so how do we support it? And then the next piece would be um, to be legendary. So lofty goal, um, but why not? Why not? And, but dependability means that it can't be run by shift, it can't be run when somebody feels good, it's just gotta be locked and loaded all the time. And then, it's consistency and, and methodology has to be not only sacrosanct, but it's interesting how um, sometimes the, the, the goals of a business don't get to the lowest common denominator, and that's the, the fun, the wonderful people that we call internal guests that run your restaurant, that run your pub, that run your business. And so they can, they in their way capture the strategy that you just spend all that time to develop. Continuous connection. So again, take a look at break your business down. So what I did is, well, franchisees have to be, my franchisees that invested their money to build my brand should be given a lot of respect. And, and, we, and we do that. Uh, and we do that through constant communication. And now again, we have not only the uh, internet, but in our case, we have an intranet. Um, we go through the website, we go through um, you created a franchise advisory board so that we have people designated by the franchisees that represent the entire contingent internationally as well as domestically. Um, we get 
data capture, we get guest feedback, we have a uh, program for each restaurant um, that on the bottom of the ticket, uh, we give a $5 uh, bounce back, basically. Uh, that if they give us an evaluation, they get $5 off the next meal, whatever it is, the next visit. And so by that, we get real-time feedback every single guest, which is really, really what you want to do. There's a lot of mystery shop, and um, or you get comment cards. And what I found is, if you have comment cards, your general manager will go through every single one of them, and the only ones you'll ever see are the ones that are good. So that doesn't work. A mystery shopper usually have some people that you pay to go into your restaurants, but they really don't know what they're looking for. They just wanted a free meal. They don't really get good information there, but I think a guest will tell you how their experience was. And what I found out was this. Uh, here's where we were lacking. Um, managers touching the tables. How many times you walk into your restaurant or your pub or your business and there's no interaction with the, with the guest? Now, the servers are doing it, the bartenders are doing it, uh, but the managers are so busy in the office that they're not on the floor, in our case. And so we changed all that around. And that feedback was essential for us to, again, deliver the legendary experience that we, that we see. Um, the big picture outcome. So again, common sense, but what I find out today is common sense isn't so common anymore. Everybody talks about it. Everybody says, well, it's common sense. Well, why aren't you doing it? And I don't see a lot of people doing this anymore at, at, the, um, uh, at, the, at all the different levels of the business. So in our case, um, this is uh, groundbreaking in one of the smaller cities in uh, Tennessee where we're building a brand new prototype, Bennigan's. And um, it's to get us to our BPO, the big picture outcome, the big picture outcomes to get the two. Everything needs to be you know, according to a metric, according to a, a quantification. So where you want to be and how you're going to get there. So that goes from how many guests you need a week to what's your average check to um, how you're going to staff and what are your costs for, for uh, achieving your different level of sales, so you can get to a profitability level that actually works for it per unit, and that rolls up to a system um, that makes you successful. The, you know, you heard about the, I think it's, what was the Russian boom? Ow, something, with the wow. Uh, and the um, embrace and embody the brand, and and talk about how do you deliver legendary? I mean, we, we people banter these, Terminology, this terminology around quite a bit. So, you know, I'm going to be the best, I'm going to be the greatest. And, but really, how do you quantify legendary? How do you quantify, wow, what does that what does that actually mean? What does it look like when it's being done? And how does it look, how do you do it if you have a brand? How do you do it through every single uh, level of, of, of where you touch a customer, where you touch your, your employees, uh, where you touch your vendors, so that you're still delivering a consistent message from group to so we came up with a mission. Now that, this is our world famous Monte Cristo sandwich. So we were talking about, uh, I was uh, in, in with a bunch of people before we were talking about, probably the most unhealthy sandwich you can probably ever get to because it's deep fried and it has ham and turkey and cheeses. Uh, but our batter is such that when, when it's a finished product, it's one of the most delicious sandwiches you'll ever have. But if you're thinking about calories, it's probably not what you want to want to have. But it's really interesting, when we did the studies, that people, even though they're, they're thinking about um, you know, what, how many calories, or what's the fat, or uh, all these different uh, conversations that you hear today, people want to have a great experience. They want to indulge themselves. They want to have fun. They want to have a good experience. And so part of that good experience is to have food that actually makes them happy, or it's comfort food. And our and, and the Monte Cristo sandwich is the number one sandwich that we, it's the number one product that we sell in all, all the vinegars, of all the different things that we have. So it's pretty amazing. But our mission is to create that legendary brand experience. So how do you do it? So it's for every guest, every meal, every day. It's not some of the times, like I said before. It, it's not, you know, it, in certain restaurants, it's every single one of them. And then to be known for remarkable people. I mean, yeah, I think you, you heard the battle cry already. We're nothing without the people. You can have the, you know, the greatest fixtures, the greatest furniture, the greatest equipment, the greatest menu. Uh, you can have a world famous chef. It doesn't matter if the people aren't getting what your mission is all about. So Pierce said it yesterday. 
You know, he's talking about what's your purpose. I'm saying it a little differently because I have a purpose and a mission statement, and the mission codifies it just a little bit more. And then to be, you know, I, I hired a chef, so we have chef-driven food. We have innovative drinks because I think the, you know, as you see around here, uh, drinks are changing. The profile is changing. Um, that the, the the younger generation that are called the millennials have a different flavor profile. They like colors. They like different tastes. They like sweetness. And so you have to you have to uh, appeal to that group because that's the up and coming group that's going to be your your mainstay customer as you look into the future. So our purpose is to live Bennigan's. What do I mean by live? Well, um, I'll talk about uh, the, the business athlete here in a minute, but by living, I mean that you have to embody your brand. I mean, if you don't live it, then, then it's a lie. You know, you're talking, but you really don't back it up. So living something is, is um, like for example, you have different sports figures, uh, athletes that embody the sport, so the sport actually doesn't define them, and you all can have your own examples of that. Uh, the sport doesn't define them, they actually define the sport, so the name becomes synonymous with the sport, and that's living it. And so I wanted to transfer that idea into every single level of the restaurant. So whether you're in the back of the house, in fact, when, when I go into our restaurants, the first place I go is to the dishwasher. Because nobody ever says hello to me. It's a high turnover position, nobody ever acknowledges. Nobody ever thanks. And so when we have a pre-shift or we have a communication, we have an all-team meeting, the first people that I want to talk to is the dishwasher. Because I want to let them know that they're important to our business. Everything that they do, from a legendary standpoint, like how about clean silverware, how about clean plates, how about clean glasses, and it's important. And so uh, that, as you follow that through, builds an emotional connection to the brand. And that's what we have at Bennigan's. The, the reason why we're coming back is because everybody remembers Bennigan's. And that emotional connection turns into a visit, and that visit turns into word of mouth. And that word of mouth turns into frequency. And that frequency turns into sales. So as we open up, we already have uh, pent up demand. So really, when you look at the business equation, a lot of us sometimes, uh, especially in, in new or emerging brands, you're trying to create demand. Well, isn't it fun to know that you already have it, now you just have to do the other part of that equation, which is give the supply, which is what we're doing not only domestically, but again, internationally as well. When I talk about, when I talk about the, um, uh, the last part of uh, A, B, C, D, it, I think it needs to be relevant to every single person in the business. So A, B, C, D is above and beyond the call of duty. So what does that mean? So how do you go above and beyond? I'll give you an example. We have a very, very high volume restaurant in Chicago. And a family came in, um, they were staying at a hotel right down the street. Uh, they, were, they were in from Iowa, I believe it was, and, and um, the kid was playing with um, Legos. And after their meal, they left and they forgot the game. They forgot the, all the different pieces and they left it there. And then when they got back to the hotel, they called up the restaurant and they said, um, uh, Dan, you know, my, my kid left the, uh, uh, the, his Lego game there and he, he still have it. Well, of course, the busboy picked it up and threw it out. And so the, uh, the server actually went to the store, bought a new Lego set, and brought it to the hotel and dropped it off. Now that to me is above and beyond the call of duty. I mean, do you do that every single time? No, but it's, it's the mentality of it. It's the attitude of it. That you actually care enough about the guest to do something that's lasting, that builds an emotional connection. Emotional connection, for those of us in, deep in the business, equals sales. Sales equals, um, you know, a revenue flow. Revenue flow equals profitability, if you know how to manage your costs. And that's what we do. So three legs of the stool. Focus, empathy, and perception. Um, so again, this is part of that strategic plan that we have. And everything that we're doing, I mean, even my being here, is to create the perception of what we're doing with, with Bennett. I think it's important. It's important to get the message out because there's a lot of people that I talk to about Bennett. That was a great, in fact, um, you know, in the States, uh, any, you guys know Michael J. Fox? He, he was, uh, he got Parkinson's disease. He's just back on TV now. And he's about five minutes into his brand new show and his sister, who's the, the woman who plays his sister on the show, talks about, she goes, I have less eggs 
in my room than many of us. I don't know what that meant, but so he says to, he says, well, whatever happened to Benning? So I said, okay, hang on. So I call my PR company. I said, get that clip, because we're gonna upload it to Facebook, and we're gonna, we're gonna say, we're gonna tell them where Benning is, because we're building these restaurants all the time. So it's a crazy little capricious thing like that, um, that helps us get the message across, that we're not only here, but we're relevant again, and we're building restaurants. Um, focus. Focus, you know, it has to be unrelenting focus because all of us have a million pieces of input a day. And we're looking left and we're looking right and we want to do this and we want to do that. I mean, just look here. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a multitude of different areas that you can focus on, whether it be furniture or drink or, you know, new spirits or new beer or uh, some emerging uh, uh, craft ale. And you can't do it all. You have to do what's consistent with your brand, what's going to sell. And you have to think through the distribution. You got to think. Uh, you have to think through uh, the pricing, uh, and make sure that it's consistent both within your price point on your menu. So it's those kinds of things that we have to focus with. The empathy is about uh, actually caring about your people, your team. Actually caring about the people that work in your restaurants, and and, and for us caring about our, our vendors, our vendors, our suppliers, our partners. I am amazed that uh, I, their help in reestablishing Benigan's has meant to me about uh, four to 500 basis points in terms of the level, you know, four to five percent uh, profitability increase per unit just because of their help and me being more efficient in my purchasing and distribution. It's amazing. But if you don't talk to them, I guarantee you won't get anything. So it's that empathy of knowing, um, you know, how to talk to your people uh, and how to understand where they're coming from, especially your customers. Uh, the culture, I talked about this a little bit. You know, what culture do you want? What do you want to stand for? So one of the things that I did, um, and it was complete serendipity. Uh, there was one of the restaurants out in Borger, Texas. Um, a guy comes in, it sounds like a joke, but I'm not any good, you're, you're much better than me on telling the jokes. Um, so he comes into the bar, he sits down, he orders two gifts. And so, he, but he's all by himself, so the bartender, the natural uh, answer, uh, response would be, well, um, why don't we wait till your friend comes and I'll pour the second one. And he goes, no, he's not coming. Just pour this, just pour it. And said it there. So she did, and he proceeds to get the, the napkin and write a message on it and put it up next to the, next to the glass. So she comes around the bar and takes a picture of it. And long story short, it was uh, a dedication and a thank you to a guy that saved his life in Afghanistan. This guy was a returning vet. So he's sitting there, and this guy, Lieutenant J.G. Frankie Toner, uh, you know, I sent chills up our collective spines when we found out what this guy did. He was, uh, it was the day before he was going to ship out. Uh, he taught Sunday school. He's a great guy. Uh, they were exercising out in the field, and one of the uh, Afghanis that they were training, of course, was uh, Al-Qaeda and got the AK-47 and started opening up fire on our people. And uh, so he charged them as the guy was firing, saved about four or five lives in the process, but sacrificed his own life uh, to, save those, to save those guys that he was with. So he, he wrote on it, um, he goes, not forgotten on the nap napkin. And he said, uh, the other part he said is, non sibi said patria, which is Latin for not for self, but for country. And it was the most, um, you know, if, if you don't get touched by that, you're not human. And uh, so we said, look, I, I don't want this to die in that one restaurant. And so uh, let's, let's do something right with it. And so what we did was I started a fund for all the veterans as they come back. In some cases, I, we get jobs. In other cases, we donate money. If, uh, for every drink that's bought, we donate $1. Uh, and that's been going on now for two and a half years. And the other thing I do is, if you come back from, um, the, if you're a veteran with an honorable discharge, and you qualify for patron financing, I waive all the franchise fees to get these great men and women uh, back, in, back in the mainstream to, to uh, earn a living and become entrepreneurs like most of us in this audience. Um, above and beyond the call of duty, it, it's not okay to be okay today, it never was. Um, and you have to do things within your organization to say, you know, how do we how do we rise above the fray? How do we again back to the focus, back to the empathy, back to the perception? 
raise above it, and deliver on our promises. Everybody has lofty mission statements, everybody has lofty purposes, but do you really deliver on it, or is it just something on the back of your business card? Licensing model. One of the things that I'm working on right now is, in addition to a franchise model, to, is to put the name out there of any and to talk to different you know, pub owners or restaurant owners and license our name because, I mean, let's face it, it's a, it's a tough business. In the U.S., there are, are over a million eating establishments. It's, there's mass proliferation. And so how do you break through that clutter? It's very, very difficult. Because there's more seats than people. So how do you get market share? So with, with the licensing for us, what we do is um, uh, we're working on the, the content now, but loosely structured, um, uh, you know, it'd be like franchise light, where you have the name, and um, we have a couple of regulations that you would have to uh, deploy within your organization from a trade dress and operation standpoint, menu standpoint. And then you can license the name and, and, and pay us uh, reduced fees instead of a full franchise fee. So it's not a full conversion, um, but it's the opportunity to use the name so you can pick up the efficiencies uh, that we have as, as well as the buying cloud. Updated brand positioning where, uh, again, some of these things that uh, I already shared with you. Um, one of the things that I haven't talked about yet that I will is um, neighborhood marketing, brand ambassadors. Uh, you've heard the terms before. I'm amazed. I'm just amazed that, I mean, this is, again, this is, goes under the common sense. Uh, I don't care where you're operating. Well, you, you drive 10 miles in every direction, draw a circle around it, that's your world. And so franchisees usually come up to me and go, are we gonna get a Super Bowl commercial? I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think newspapers work anymore. I don't think um, the, the TV works anymore. What I think works is going out, and I think uh, Oliver, you mentioned it yesterday with guerrilla marketing, I call it neighborhood marketing, where you go out and you actually knock on doors, uh, you shake hands and you kiss babies and you build a relationship. And you get people to, to, to actually feel like you, they, that you really want their business. And you go out to the businesses, you go out to the residences, and you let people know that you're open, you let people know that you're relevant, you let people know that you want their business. And you can do, continue to do that. But the key would be, who does it? Who does it in your restaurant? So we created a position called the brand ambassador. So not only does this individual manage the social media piece, because every store has a Facebook, and then, um, believe it or not, there's, this, uh, uh, there's a bifurcation in Facebook where there's a parent and a child. <laughs> I didn't know any of this. I, I, I came kicking and screaming into this, but. It was uh, one of those things where the, the child would be the franchisee, which, which would have a sub-page to your, your parent page. So this way you could control content. So not everybody could do anything, anytime, anywhere, and still stay consistent with your, your trade dress and, and integrity of the brand. So we've been doing that, and the brand ambassador is in charge of that. So we went from you know, 1,000 likes to, uh, in the case of the, um, in the, case of the, uh, the individual that, that sacrificed his life, two, million likes. So what happened? They called me up and said, would you go on, um, you know, in, in the States, I went on CNN, I went on MSNBC, I went on Neil Cavuto, and they're all talking about what a great gesture this was, and at the same time, I took advantage of delivering our message that, hey, we're back again. So it worked. A nod to our heritage, I had to throw this slide in just to make everybody feel good, because I'm an island. So I wanted, to, I wanted to show that we took bits and pieces to it because a lot of people say, well, what is a Bennigan's? And we're a restaurant. We're family friendly. We're not a pub. Um, and I don't pretend to sell Irish food because it's anybody in this audience will certainly know that we don't. Um, but it's a, it's the, the, the Irish part of Bennigan's is a warm and friendly hospitality. It's the service orientation. It's that we really want to know that we appreciate your business. And so these are the kinds of things and ways that we define it. Uh, so some people want to know what did, what did the new concept look like? This is the new prototype. Again, when you strip it all down, it said the, the old eight to 10,000 square foot buildings just don't work. It's two and a half acres. It's a real expensive proposition. Uh, you can't fill it. And I'd rather have a smaller footprint that we can fill all the time uh, and make it feel intimate and lively than, than something big and, 
and cumbersome that you can only fill on Friday nights and Saturday nights. And, and so this is this is what it looks like from freestanding. I'll also look at strip centers and go inside. And, and the the, uh, the sweet spot in the square footage is 5,000 square feet. This is the interior look. Uh, the other thing, if you can see Dallas up on Tom, wherever I go, I put the name of the city. Because I don't want it to be the Bennigan's corporate store. I want it to be wherever we are. So there's Tyson's Corner, and there's Panther, Texas, and there's Panama City, and there's Dubai, and, and everywhere else where we are. So it's there, Bennigan, so they can feel that, again, empathetic. Benning is on the fly. So um, here's the thing that, that we talked about last night, Mr. Dubai Mall. We talked about this. This is this is the non-traditional. So it's like, who's who's winning market share today? Well, it's the it's the fast casual. So it's the people that um, are serving good food, but you got to wait in line. You got to order your food. You sit down, but you don't leave a tip. Uh, people are conscious of how much money they have to spend, and um, and they're being very very. Uh, you know, very keen on where they're spending it, and so on fast casual is winning a lot of market share right now. So I said, okay, so let's let's fish where the fish are. So I took a Benigan's and scaled it down so we can go into airports, we can go into universities, we can go into hospitals, we can go into cruise ships. You know, it's all about the math. If the math works, the investment works, and it pencils out, then, then we'll take a, look, a hard look at it. I wanted to give you a, a, a sneak peek at the, the new prototype for Steak and Ale. That's what it looks like. So I again, I, I've um, paid respect to our history, and yet put it in a brand new format. New menus, everything everything on the menu was taken a hard look at. So, uh, and then you can see with the with the, the names of our uh, products that we, we have some fun with the, with the Irish. Uh, again, paying respect to. So uh, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, his name is Timmy Hogan, and he married a Chinese woman and so I thought Hogan's egg rolls would be perfect. So we named it after him. And then we have uh, one of the guys that, uh, that works for us in, in operations, he's our VP of operations, great guy, he's been with Bennigan's for 26 years, and his name is Sean Finn. So I don't know, uh, and he would have loved last night, I don't think he would have loved uh, the Guinness uh, storehouse, uh, because that's, that's, his, that's his drink of choice. And so I named uh, the Finn's beer batter fish and chips after him. So it's again, it's giving people, I think we can have fun with it. Um, we pay respect to everybody with it. And uh, Danny Boy's Chicken is the uh, uh, name after my, my VP of training. And, and so it's, it's fun, but yet it's still very Irish, but it's a nod and a wink and an embrace to an Irish pest. On the, on the drinks, uh, again, the, 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 the beverage part of our menu contributes about 25 to 30%, depending on where we're, lo we're located. And um, uh, if you can see, we don't have a Long Island iced tea, we have a Long Ireland iced tea. And then we have a, uh, uh, the Irish coffee, which I thought, did anybody have the Irish coffee last night? Man, that was good. That was really good. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna steal that glass. I already asked for a couple of dozen of those glasses because I was gonna start serving the Irish coffee in. And, uh, and I was lucky enough to be sitting with the, with the uh, is Paul here? He said he was gonna be here. Uh, I was sitting with the, the Guinness boys last night I learned, I learned a lot more than they wanted me to learn, I think. Um, and so the, 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 the bar menu, the specialty drink menu, is actually on a green wine bottle that we set on the table. And, uh, and then the part of the service piece is that the server points to the bottle and then talks about the specialties. There used to be, if you remember back, you know, not so long ago actually, that wherever you went to a casual dining, there were books they would give you on menu, there were books they would give you on, uh, on, on drinks. And I don't know who thought that that was a good idea, but nobody really reads them, and they always order what they always order. So if it's a burger and a beer, they're gonna get that. Uh, and, but if, it, if you reduce it, because our menu now is one page, and then the specialty drink menu is just on the bottom at the table, so it makes it a little bit more fun in order for trial, which is what you want, and, and again, it builds, it builds more frequency in the visits. Legendary favorites, um, of course, uh, on the on the stout Guinnesses. Uh, 